Okay, uh, good afternoon to everyone, and perhaps also good morning to some of you. Uh, my name is Erik Dahlman, I work at Ericsson Research, where I have been working for rather many years. I've been involved in the development of different mobile te uh, communication technologies, essentially from 3G on to 4G, and I'm now into 5G. And today I will talk about 5G radio and primarily about the new 5G radio access technology that is known as NR. So we'll start a little bit more kind of general overview discussion. What do we mean by 5G and why do we do 5G? What are we going to have it for? Then I will have a short discussion about 5G spectrum. Spectrum is of course very important for all kind of wireless communication. Then I will go into specifically NR, that is the new 5G radio access technology, discussing the 3DPP status, the 3DPP time plan for that, uh, giving a technical overview, focusing a little bit on the similarities and differences towards uh, 4G technology, and then some specific emphasis on some specific uh, topics. And then if the time uh, allows, I will also give a short overview of the next step of NR, essentially what we are doing in 3DPP right now. So 5G is of course means fifth generation and the name of course comes before, before 5G. We've had four earlier generations. Uh, of these, the first and second generation, they were very much about supporting mobile telephony, speed services. With the 3G technology, we came into the mobile broadband, which was then further emphasized and further enhanced when we came into 4G LTE. And the question now is, of course, I mean, why do we do 5G? What is 5G going to provide? Is it just kind of even better mobile broadband or is it something else? And it is partly, it is partly just mobile, it is partly enhanced mobile broadband, but it's also partly something else. Uh, a key thing with 5G, a thing that is very much discussed is this about expanding the use case of mobile communication, not just being about mobile broadband, uh, high data rates, high capacity, but also about supporting wireless communication from a lot of, for a lot of other applications. It could be like control of different services, different infrastructure, uh, control of smart, for smart vehicles and traffic, remote control of vehicles. It could be about co uh, communication from a kind of enormous amount of sh low cost sensors that is kind of uh, providing data from a lot of places. And in some sense, I typically say that the most interesting and the most challenging application for 5G is actually the one I have down in the, uh, in the corner, namely the one we don't know about yet. Uh, because we would be rather naive if we believe that we could now en uh, uh, envision everything that mobile wireless communication can be used for for the next 10 years. So the key thing is really for 5G to provide a very flexible solution which can adapt to new type of services. But, but in general also this leads then to a situation where we have a much wider range of uh, requirements and capabilities compared to the earlier generations. I mean we will still go for even higher data rates and even higher traffic capacity which has been kind of the target both for the 3G and 4G technologies. But we also need a system that can really um, support a truly massive number of devices. I mean, we're talking about perhaps tens of billions of devices. Uh, we need to have, be able to have devices that can be of extremely low cost, maybe even a fraction of a dollar and have battery life that may last for 10 years. Uh, and at the same time, we have to have possibility to uh, provide services that requires extremely low latency, even lower than the kind of latency we can support in our systems today. And at the same time, perhaps also provide an extreme uh, degree of reliability and availability, even higher than the reliability we have in our systems of today. So one key thing with 5G MK challenge has really been this, how to support this very wide range of requirements within one technology. Quite often, and perhaps some, many of you have heard about this, quite often in, uh, when we talk about 5G, we are referring to three different classes of, of use cases or three different classes of services uh, 
We have the basic, what we typically call the enhanced mobile broadband, which is essentially, I mean, enhancing the kind of service that we're already providing with systems of today. Going to support even higher data rates, supporting even higher traffic capacity. Then we talk about often about what we call massive MTC or MMTC type of services, which really examples of these are really these kind of very low cost sensors, enormous amount of uh, uh, devices that also typically have to have very low energy consumption. As I said, it could be like having device sit this, uh, for a fraction of a dollar sitting on a wall there without being possible to charge for 10 years or so. That's, that's one, and the second group of applications. And then the third group of applications is the one that we often goes under a somewhat strange abbreviation, URLLC or ultra reliable and low latency communication. That is seen as those services that require extremely low latency, much lower latency than what we have in our system today and much lower uh, latency than them is required for the mobile broadband services. And also require extreme reliability and extreme availability. Not to think that we perhaps have an error rate of 10 to the minus 3 or so, but perhaps talk about 10 to the minus 9 in error rates. What is important to understand, I think, is that although we often talk about these three different types of services, to some extent these have just been a little bit artificially created to simplify the standardization process to be able to kind of easily define different requirements for 5G. There will of course be many services in the future that will not fall directly into one of these groups. There could be services that requ have requires very low device cost, but maybe where the device energy consumption is not very important because you have access to the electrical grid to, to charge the device. Or there could be other services that have like very high data rates, but still require very low latency, but not have to be this extreme reliability. So one should be lit, one should have in mind that in the end, there will be a lot of services that does not fit right into these um, different classes. But anyway, uh, if you now see that 5G is very much about supporting these new type of services. At the same time, it's quite clear that a lot of these services, they will actually be not require this new, a new interface, but they will actually be provided by the evolution of technologies we have today. So from that point of view, at least from our, uh, we would really like, like to see 5G as not being one specific interface solution, but 5G radio access is actually, in some sense, the overall radio access solution that we have to support all these kind of new type of services in the future. And evolution of LTE, the evolution of 4G will be a very important part of that. So from that point of view, the evolution of LTE is actually part of the overall 5G radio access solution. Then it's definitely so that many people actually associate 5G radio with this new 5G radio access technology NR. And as I said, that is the one I will focus about most of this, uh, in the rest of the presentation. However, before, uh, however, before I do that, I would just like to really illustrate how LTE is evolving. We, LTE, the 4G, was introduced in 2009, and already in 2011 we came to what we call 3D People Release 10, where we start to add more features, actually expanding the, the bandwidth of LTE. In later releases, we have introduced support for operation in unlicensed spectrum, support for direct communication between LTE devices without going via the network. We have introduced means to actually better support these massive MTC type of applications. So there's been a lot of evolution of LTE already and that evolution will definitely continue. And then one can of course ask oneself, why do we need a new radio interface? Why do we need this NR radio access technology if we have any LTE evolution? Why can't we not con just continue to evolve LTE? Well, there are certain things that are kind of constrained by evolution. One thing is that the evolution of LTE is fundamentally constrained by this backwards compatibility, essentially meaning that as an operator evolves its, uh, his or her LTE system, adding more features, a legacy devices, that, that, that is device that is already out on the market, all out, already out there among customers, 
they have to still continue in this evolved network. And that to some extent limits what you can do with the evolution of a technology. So that's, that's by one very concrete kind of constraint of, an ev of the evolution of LTE. Another more not so kind of concrete or not so kind of distinct uh, reason to actually go for new radio X technology is that as one evolve a technology, add more and more features into the spec into an already existing specifications, in some sense the specification becomes more and more comp complicated. Uh, it, you, it's more and more you try to fit new features into a specification that already exists by like roughly once every 10 years actually re do a restart and create a new specification is a way of actually cleaning up the specification the text. So I think that is a more also another reason why there is a benefit at certain times to go to a new generation of mobile communication. But now let's go into this NR technology, so which is then this new five new 5G radio X technology that is being the, um, specified by the 3D PP standardization group. And actually, this, the work on NR uh, started not that long ago. It actually started a little bit more than two years ago in the spring of 2016. And originally, actually, it, uh, in thinking was that my uh, 3D people should conclude this work on NR in 2019 to actually be ready for what we say a submission to ITU uh, in 2020. But for different reasons that were coming from requirements from different operators that wanted to have this technology earlier, 3D people had actually to work in a more accelerated uh, time schedule. So the first release of NR was finalized little bit of what you mean by it. In ordered in December 2017, as at the end of last year, we were actually finalizing the first release of NR, which at that time was limited to so-called non-standalone operation. I will come back to that a little bit to that later, but that is a non-standalone NR operation essentially means that an operator has to operate NR together with LTE so that devices are actually communicating with LTE and NR at the same time. You cannot have NR operating as a completely standalone system. But now then at the, in the, during the summer or in June this year also the kind of standalone version of NR was completed. So from that time I mean it's possible to actually deploy NR as a completely standalone system. So, so if fun formula now, we have actually concluded the first release of, of NR. There are of course still several kind of small things to fix. Uh, there is always that small things to adjust, things that we kind of discover at late stage. But the main focus on 3 gpp is now more and more actually uh, going towards uh, what we call NR release 16, that is the next release of NR. In parallel to that, we are also now working on kind of preparing this submission to ITU because, uh, as, a, as NR as a candidate or as a technology for what N ITU is calling IMT 2020, which is essentially the kind of ITU name for an official 5G technology. Coming a little bit into spectrum. Um, Spectrum is of course a very critical thing for any kind of wireless communication and one of the key features and key characteristics of NR compared to early technologies is that it implies a very dramatic extension in the range of frequencies on which the system can operate. If in some sense every generation of mobile communication has kind of a little bit expanded the, uh, the frequency range going up to higher frequencies. If you take the first analog systems, they were actually down below 1 gigahertz. And then we came to 2G, we start to go up into 1.8 gigahertz, 3G going into 2 gigahertz. And now actually 4G, we're going into three, around 3 gigahertz frequency range. But now with uh, NR, we're really going much higher, well into what we call the millimeter wave. That is up to several ten of tens gigahertz, uh, practice up to around 40 gigahertz um, range. Actually, if one go back a few years, then it was actually so that 5G was more or less synonymous 
with going to higher frequencies. It was kind of uh, everyone saw 5G was only about operating at higher frequencies. Uh, uh, after that, people more and more started to realize that high frequencies are good in many ways. Going to high frequencies gives us op uh, opens up much more spectrum, so we can have much more traffic. It also allows for much wider transmission bandwidths, allowing for higher data rates. But higher frequency operation, higher frequencies are also associated with, in some sense, much worse propagation conditions. Lord, uh, essentially, we have much shorter range when you communicate at higher frequencies. So today, everyone, essentially, everyone understands that the lower frequencies where we are operating today will remain as, in some sense, the backbone of our wireless networks, providing the possibility for wide area coverage for the communication. And then we have the higher frequencies up in the millimeter wave range as some complement, providing very high traffic capacity and very high data rates, but then only in dense deployments. Looking more specifically, I mean, uh, um, although I told, said that 5G was kind of from of all from the low frequencies all the way up to kind of several 10 gigahertz. There are, s in practice, there are of course only a limited set of frequency bands really, really defined for, for NR. And essentially, one can say that it's, it really comes in two groups. We have the lower frequencies, what we typically call below 6 gigahertz, but in practice perhaps below 5 gigahertz, which are essentially similar kind of bands that we have today when we operate our systems. And that is in, in 3D people referred to as frequency range 1 or F or 1. And then we have a second group of fre frequencies, which is much higher up, essentially around 30 gigahertz, more, more from 24 gigahertz up to around 30 gigahertz, and then another one which is around 39 gigahertz. And that is then referred to FR2. So it's essentially it's these you, one a little bit different between frequencies below 6 gigahertz on one hand. And then on the other hand, frequencies around 30 up to 40 gigahertz of spectrum. And NR will then operate in all these frequencies. Just an example, this illustrates some of the more, probably more important bands for NR. As I said, up, we have up on the, three, uh, on the millimeter wave, we have 24 to 29 gigahertz. That is a spectrum that will be a lot of use in North America, also in some Asian companies, partly also in Europe. And then we're also even further up around so specific, uh, more specifically uh, 39 gigahertz, which also will be available and used extensively in the North America. On the other hand, then we have uh, spectrum around from 3.3 gigahertz to 4.2 gigahertz, which is uh, seen as a very important band for NR. It was uh, earlier seen as very likely band for LTE, but now more and more operators are seeing this as a band for NR. But then finally, there are also some operators that are actually considering utilizing this new radio te te technology as low as on 700 megahertz. Of course, then they will not get very wide transmission bandwidth and very high data rates, but on the other hand, one will get very good coverage. I, sorry, I, oops. Uh, one more aspect. Uh, uh, something we have always very intensively discussed during the years for both 3G and 4G technologies has been about the so-called duplex arrangement. Duplex arrangement essentially saying how do we separate up downlink transmissions from network down to devices? How do we separate that from uplink transmissions from devices up to the network? And if you look back, our previous generations have at least one first, second and third generation has very much been about so-called FTD or frequency division duplex where we have paired spectrum, we have an uplink band and a downlink uplink band and a downlink band and communication in these two directions as it goes in two different frequency bands. We have especially already for 4G also, also start to use more and more so-called unpaired spectrum using TDD where uplink and downlink takes place in the same spectrum and then it's instead separated in time. So you are switching it between uplink and downlink very rapidly. And if we look now at NR, essentially the lower spectrum below 3 gigahertz will most likely continue to be FTD, also for NR, because 
there are certain benefits of FDD, especially uh, when it comes to providing kind of wide area coverage, large, large range, large cells. On the other hand, as we go up in frequencies, up to the high frequency, especially up to the really high frequency around 30 gigahertz, then it will essentially only be TDD, where we have only one carrier and we are separating uplink and downlink in time. And there are other reasons for that. Uh, obviously, it's easier to find than you only need to find one single carrier instead of having two spec pieces of spectrum, one for uplink and downlink. There are also some very specific re benefits of TDD when it comes to these advanced beam forming that are critical components for NR and that I will come back to a little bit later. Now going even further into a little bit about the details of NR and the difference to uh, LTE. One such difference is the carrier bandwidths. The carrier bandwidths, of course, the wider bandwidths, the, the high data is one can have. And in LT, original LT had a carrier ba maximum carrier bandwidth of 20 megahertz. That is still the maximum carrier bandwidth, but as I mentioned earlier in this part of LT evolution, in LT release 10 that was introduced in 2011, the concept of carrier aggregation was introduced, where one can actually have multiple carriers in parallel for communicating between a base station and a single device. And LTE allows for carrying with up to five carriers, and thus with each carrier maximum bandwidth of 20 megahertz means that the maximum bandwidth by which one can communicate with the device in LTE is 100 megahertz. In NR, the maximum carrier bandwidth is, as, is actually 400 megahertz. And there is a possibility, at least according to specification, to aggregate up to 16 carriers, which implies that, the, in, at least in theory, the maximum bandwidth of an LTE, an NR transmission, is 6.4 gigahertz. Now, of course, in practice, in most cases, or I can say, in practice, there does not exist any spectrum for NR at this stage that allows for such wide transmission bandwidth. So, part of this should be seen as kind of, we have a little bit taking some margin for new spectrum coming up, etc. But at least fundamentally, it shows that NR can support much wider transmission bandwidth. And there will definitely be deployments of NR supporting 400 and even 800 megahertz uh, transmissions, which is still kind of a factor of four or a factor of eight larger than the maximum transmission bandwidth man can have with LZ. So I think that that is kind of one, one aspect of, of NR. Then if one go into uh, even more de details, and this perhaps not showing so much the difference between NR and LTE, but actually showing that on a lot of these kind of basic transmission principles, they are actually very similar. Uh, and the waveform is in some sense the most basic of all aspects of wireless communication. That's kind of the, the basic physical principles by which one transmits information over the air. And LTE there uses what we call OFDM, essentially meaning that this our overall carrier that can be up to 20 megahertz wide is actually consists of a very large number of very narrow band so-called subcarriers, which in the LT case are have a bandwidth each of 15 kilohertz. And in downlink we're using essentially a conventional OFDM. In the uplink we're using a little bit of a modification of OFDM, which is called DFT pre-coded OFDM. And the reason for that is just that we want to have it's a little bit beneficial in terms of the device transmitter power efficiency. And for NR, I mean, there is not a fundamental difference there. I mean, we could, of course, have looked into completely new transmission schemes, etc. But it was quite soon realized that we can't do very much on this aspect. We can't do very much better than we already do down for LT. So NR is also based on downlink conventional OFDM. In the uplink, we have a little bit more flexibility. We can have conventional OFDM or this DFT pre-coded OFDM. One difference between NR and LTE is that as I said, LTE has like always 15 kilohertz subcarry spacing. For NR, we actually have a, a much more flexibility where you actually can select subcarry spacing depending on your deployment scenarios, etc. So you can support a 15 kilohertz subcarry spacing, which essentially makes the NR carrier very similar to an LTE carrier. But we can also have higher subcarry spacings, 30 kilohertz. 60 kilohertz and 120 20 kilohertz and this also leads to I mean as you go up up in subcarry spacing each of your transmission symbols actually becomes shorter in time which we see have a 
benefit, benefit in terms of latency. So, I mean, why do we then have this kind of flexible numerology for NR? As in LTE, we only have 50 kilohertz. In NR, we have 15, 30, 60, and 120. It really has to do with this, may primarily have to do with this very wide range of spectrum that NR is to operate in. Essentially, then, one numerology does not fit all. One, what one could say, if uh, as we go up to this very high frequency range, up to 30 gigahertz, 40 gigahertz, then we really need a higher numerology than 15 kilohertz in order to be robust against Doppler frequency, uh, phase noise, all of which are more severe as we go up in frequency. On the other hand, at, at, in the lower frequency bands where we do not need that high numerology, there is instead a benefit of the lower numerology where we have longer symbols because that it makes it easier or makes it more robust to operate uh, with wide area coverage or more efficient to operate with the large cells. And as I said, another benefit of the high numerology is also that as you have higher order numerology, you get shorter symbols, and that enables the lower latency, which is then, of course, an important re uh, requirement or important thing we want to achieve with NOR. So maybe a little bit discuss that as well. I mean, why? What, what are what are the features in an NOR that provides us with lower latency than than LT? I mean, I always mention one thing. I mean, we have high numerology, may, uh, do, enabling shorter symbols, and that in turn enables shorter slots. A slot is essentially consisting of 14 uh, symbols in both NR and LT. And if we now have transmissions that are kind of confi confined within slots, if we have shorter slots, we can uh, do the transmission quicker and we can get a kind of lower latency. So just an example, if we have 15 kilohertz numerology, we are having a one millisecond slot. If we still have a 60 kilohertz uh, numerology, we have four times shorter symbols and four times shorter slots. So 0.25 millisecond slots instead, which is a corresponding uh, reduction in the latency. Even more important actually for, for NR that while for LT we are really confined to have transmissions within these, we are really have to have transmission confined within slots. So uh, a transmission have to start at the slot boundary and have to go on for the entire slot. In NR, we actually have a disconnect. Uh, uh, we we don't, have, don't have this kind of direct connection between where you transmit and the slots. So you can actually start transmission not on slot boundary, but on any symbol. And we can have the transmission going on, on for an essential arbitrary number of symbols, much shorter than an entire slot. And that's, of course, also have a benefit in terms of latency, because when data comes in and you are to transmit it, you don't have to wait for the start of a slot to do the transmission. But you can start it immediately at the first available symbol, and then you don't have to carry out the transmission over the entire slot, but you can just carry out over a few, few number of symbols. A third aspect of ANR that, uh, that enables lower latency is that we, we are doing these retransmissions that we always do. I mean, quite often we think the first transmission becomes erroneous and we have to retransmit. And all in LTE, we can do that very quickly. We can do that after eight slots. So we have like an eight milliseconds time between retransmissions. But, but in NR, we can do it even much faster. We can do it actually within two slots. So instead of having to wait eight milliseconds for retransmission, if you have the same numerology and a slot based transmission, we can actually do the retransmission already after two milliseconds. And this is no kind of fundamental invention that allows for this. This is really that we are utilizing the uh, enhancements in the processing capabilities. Uh, what was possible to do in terms of fast decodings, etc. Where, uh, well, what was not possible to do in terms of fast decoding, etc., when LT was designed, is now seen as being possible for NR. So overall, this enables more than uh, rough hour. What we see at uh, more than ten times lower radio interface latency compared to LT. Now, one should of course have in mind that the radio interface latency is only a small part of the overall latency, end-to-end -end latency. There are a lot of other factors that contribute to the overall latency, but at least from the point of view of us designing the radio interface, our aim is to ensure that the latency of the overall air interface is so short that that does not become a bottleneck in the overall latency. Now, uh, going into another very important aspect of uh, NR, and it's this aspect of beamforming. Beamforming essentially means that transmissions are not carried out in a wide uh, 
over a wide uh, angle or widely spread, but really we focus transmission to a device in, a st in the specifically in the direction of the device. And we do that by having in practice, and uh, instead of having a single antenna or a few antennas, we have like a antenna panel with a rather large number of antenna elements and by now feeding those the antenna elements with the same signal but with different phases we can really make them uh, sh uh, ensure that all these transmissions then add up constructively at a certain direction and this of course has it has two benefits i mean one thing is that by focusing energy in the in the direction of the, of the target receiver then of course, we, for a given transmit power, we, the target receiver is received with more power or alternately, we can reach further. So we essentially extend the range. It's also uh, by focusing energy, transmit energy in a certain direction, we cause less interference in the other direction, which essentially creates higher system capacity. And in the end, we may be able to have multiple transmissions going on to different devices within the same cell using the same time frequency resources by ensuring that these different beams are pointing in different directions. And beam forming is, I mean, it's beneficial for all kinds of transmission. It's always beneficial, regardless of the frequency band, to reach as far as possible or to add to a kind of get as high capacity as possible. But for different reasons, beam forming is especially of interest and especially critical when we go to these higher frequencies. And it's really two aspects here. I mean, one thing is that as I said, higher frequencies are inherently, has inherently worse coverage than the lower frequencies. And beamforming is then a key technology to actually get decent coverage for the high frequencies. So one can say that beamforming is critical to get coverage at the higher frequencies. At the same time, beamforming is also especially good to use. Or I mean, can, I can say, I mean, high frequency really enables beamforming. And this really has to do with how Essentially, I have this antenna array with a lot of antenna elements, and if I want to make an even more narrow beam, I just add more and more antenna elements, which implies that, of course, the overall antenna configuration increases in size, and at once, at once, some stage becomes like unreasonably large. But if I had to then also, but at the same time, go up in frequency, actually, each of these small antenna elements shrinks, and the distance between all these antenna elements shrinks in proportion to the wavelengths. So what one can say that fundamentally, I mean, I, if I have a, a certain antenna, antenna array with a certain number of elements, if I increase the frequency by a factor of 10, reducing the wavelengths by a factor of 10, actually the area of the entire antenna constellation goes down by a factor of 100. So it, that actually means that for high frequencies, it's much easier to get very large gain with a reasonable uh, antenna size, uh, overall antenna size. So one can say that, uh, I mean, this massive beam forming is really critical for coverage at the high frequencies, but it's also uh, what enables, uh, the high frequency is also what enables this massive beam forming by allowing for massive beam forming with a decently sized uh, panel. And I mean, this figure just shows the example of this. This, this is an antenna element that actually have 128, this is an uh, array antenna with 128 antenna elements operating at 28 gigahertz and we can see I mean it's it's then it's not a very big thing I mean it's the same size as these kind of relatively small small batteries uh, so that's re but really I realize that at this high frequency we can really put in antenna arrays with a rather large number of antenna elements even in a handheld device Yes, I mean, sometimes when you hear, when you talk about um, beamforming, of course, one can implement beamforming in different ways. Fundamentally, as I said, beamforming is about adjusting the phase of the different signals so, so that uh, they add up constructively in a certain direction. And you can, it really, you can really do that kind of adjustment or that beamforming at different places within your transmitter chain or equally well in your receiver chain. Uh, when we talk, we often we talk about analog beamforming, which is the most simple way of doing it, then you really do these phase adjustments in the, in the analog domain. So you have your signal, your digital signal, you transform it into, uh, from digital to analog, and then you do this beam forming once, uh, one, one kind of phase adjustment for each antenna. And this is relatively simple to do. This is mainly the way they've been done initially, 
especially at the high frequencies. It has the drawback, but as we have this analog, digital to analog converter before the beamforming, if we have multiple signals from the base station that we want to transmit in different directions, we can't really do that at the same time. We can only create one beam for, for the entire analog signal. The other, the other extreme way is what we call the digital beamform, which is some kind of the, the ultimate solution where you really do everything in the digital domain. You apply your antenna weights or your phase shift in the an, uh, on the digital signal, and then you have one digital to analog converter for each antenna. This provides full flexibility. You allows you for kind of beamform different signals in different directions at the same time, but it comes at a very high complexity. You essentially need one digital to analog converter per antenna. And I don't really actually have this kind of small antenna array that had 128, 128 antenna elements, which was the size of a little bit larger than a battery. And then at the same time, you need 128 DA converters. Uh, if you want to squeeze in th those into that small area, if it's nothing else, it becomes a very hot piece of equipment. So as I said, I mean, initially we will do analog beamforming or a little bit of combination where we have like possibility to act perhaps create, we have perhaps uh, four DA converted, being able to create four different parallel beams, but not this full digital beamforming. But the standard is fully prepared for full digital beamforming when this, so that it can be used when that is kind of being possible to implement in reality. Oops, sorry. Um, going to um, and one other important aspect of LTE or NR is this possibility for NR LTE coexistence. As I said, I mean, NR will be deployed in a wide range of spectrum. It will be deployed up in very high frequencies, which is in some sense new spectrum or at least spectrum that is not used by any wireless tech kind of mobile communication system today. But NR will also be deployed in the lower spec frequency spectrum because it provides very good coverage. The issue there is, of course, that that spectrum is today or at today already occupied by other systems in practice by LTE, or at least within the next few years will be all will be deployed will be occupied by LTE. So then we come to the question: I mean, how, how can we kind of introduce L N or in those spectrum in such spectrum where LTE is already existing? And there are essentially two ways of doing this: uh, spectrum migration or spectrum the spectrum coexist coexistence. And I mean spectrum migration, that's that's the classical way of doing this. This is the way we have done for every generation. I mean, we have my, we have partly migrating LTE spectrum to L uh, GSM spectrum to LTE. We have partly migrated 3D spectrum to LTE. It's essentially say, uh, implies that in this case we have so operator have some spectrum operating uh, operating LTE in that spectrum. It can be 20 megahertz carrier. Although this looks like a 20 uh, one carrier, of course, this could also be operated at 40 megahertz and it's actually operating two carriers in some kind of two 20 megahertz carriers and then having possibility for carrier aggregation. And then if one wants to introduce NR in the spectrum, one in practice have to take some of the LT spectrum, spectrum, take away LT from there using LT on the more narrow bandwidth, perhaps 20 megahertz, and then on this kind of newly freed spectrum, deploy an, uh, then an NR carrier of 20 megahertz. And then perhaps very far into the future, we don't need, we don't need an LD anymore, and then we can completely drop LT and we can uh, have NR using the entire spectrum. But that will be very far into the future because the operator have to support all these ex already existing LT terminals, and some of them may exist for a long time. And this works fine in many, in many cases, and it is f sufficiently good in many cases, especially for operators that have a lot of spectrum. But it has certain problems. Uh, one is, of course, that as you do this, initially when you introduce NR, you, you, there will be very few NR devices out there. The vast majority of devices will still be LTE, and the vast amount of traffic will still be from LTE devices. And when, but when you do this, you're actually you're obviously losing some of your LTE capacity. So you must do this very carefully. If you take away too much LTE spectrum, you cannot support all your LTE traffic. And 
you will be able, you, the data rate you can support for LTE users will be reduced because they cannot they will not see the same wide bandwidth anymore. And also on the end of side, as I said initially there will be very few uh, devices of capacity not an issue, but you cannot give them the full bandwidth that the NR can support. So in some sense you can't give them the full kind of capability of NR. And as I mentioned, I mean you have to you can't really get rid of it will take a very long time until you can kind of actually fully get rid of LTE. So that you have, because you may have to support a few remaining LTE devices for a long time, which will for a very long time kind of, uh, kind of limit the capabilities of the NR system. But still, this is, the, this is the classical way of doing migrating spectrum, and it will often be used in, for, for LTE to NR migration and it will work fine in many cases. It works fine for operators that have a lot of LTE spectrum that can very gradually move more and more spectrum into NR. But NR all supports what we call coexistence where you don't need to take away LTE even if you introduce NR but, but you can actually deploy NR right on top of LTE in the same spectrum and the LTE carrier will not cause more interference to N uh, the NR carrier will not cause more interference to LTE than LTE is anyway causing to itself. And all this, of course, comes from this basic characteristic of NR that you said they have this, they have essentially the same waveform. And that is actually so that there is one numerology, 15 kilohertz of NR, that actually fully compatible with the N with the LTE numerology. So the, such an L NR carrier will essentially look exactly like an NR, uh, such an NR carrier will essentially look like an LTE carrier. And of course one sees the, the benefits on this. It's not so that in this middle step here we have suddenly doubled the capacity, but because these two, they share the overall network capacity, but that sharing can be very dynamic. At a certain time instant one needs more LTE capacity, and then have less NR capacity, and the next time instant one needs more NR capacity, and one have less LTE capacity. And one have the full bandwidth available for both systems so you uh, there's no kind of limitation in the peak data rates and it's very easy to kind of keep LTE there for a long time uh, when actually LTE requires extremely little capacity but you still have to keep the possibility of LTE devices to communicate because there may be some few LTE devices out there in the market and that can easily be done and it, those essentially do not call cause any harm whatsoever to the NR system that is now essentially operating by itself. So this is a kind of a very smooth way of creating a migration from uh, LTE into NR. Uh, oops, I skipped that one. As I said, um, this is really enabled by this the fact that we have an L NR and LTE have the basic enabler is really the same numerology and same waveform between NR and LTE, which essentially makes they they will look the same to each other. So putting an NR carrier on top of an LTE carrier is nothing different than putting kind of an LTE carrier on top of another, uh, putting two an L any LTE carrier on top of each other. Then there are some other features also that makes it even more better. But the fundamental thing is this possibility for the same. Uh, Numeral the same waveform. So th now we have talked a little bit about beamforming, coexistence, etc. I mean, it's something been very much about how do we ensure that we can provide very high data, rate, good coverage, etc. And that is still very much aligned this enhanced mobile broadband use case. What about these other 5G use cases? Massive MTC and URLLC. Actually, when it comes to massive MTC, there has not been any real focus within NR standardization to ensure that NR can support that in a very good way. And the reason is really that it's a rather common view that the massive MTC applications, they will mainly be provided by LTE and its evolution. And that comes from this, that the, in, the key thing really, when to, especially to create low device cost, that is really to have a mature technology with a very large footprint. Uh, that's the reason actually why today the main technology for this is still GSM. I mean, uh, GSM, I mean, we, we, don't, we don't need GSM for voice, we don't need GSM for data, but still the key technology today for these 
very cheap devices with sensors etc. That's actually GSM because the GSM devices have been out for such a long time so they can be made extremely che uh, cheap. And uh, uh, LTE actually have two, two tra in some sense, two tracks for this. One thing is the, what we call CAT M1, which essentially is saying that we have different categories of, devi of device classes. Where originally CAT category 1, CAT1 was the least, least complex and category 5 was the most complex. And then as part of LTE evolution, it will conclude that all of these categories are actually too complex for the really cheap devices. So instead we made this even less complex device category called CAT0. And then we took the next step and that was called CAT-1, which then is CAT M1. So that is really kind of, in, in some sense, just by, in extension of LTE by introducing a new type of device class that can have lower complexity as it does not need the same bandwidth. Uh, earlier, all the DSM LTE devices needed to support 20 megahertz bandwidth. CAT M1 devices can have operated with 1.25 megahertz. It has better coverage compared to kind of earlier devices and more longer battery life due to better this what you call discontinuous reception. So it's really a device category that allows for lower complex devices with longer battery life. Narrow I IoT is something different. Uh, Narrowband IoT is actually something that originally was not at all related to LTE. It was really an activity about how do we uh, coming up with a new air interface solution that would replace GSM for these extremely low cost devices. And there were discussions about a lot of different technical solutions, but at some stage it was concluded that let's make this still compatible with LTE so that we can actually operate it even within an LTE carrier or operate it just within the guard bands between two LTE carriers. Or it can still operate as a standalone itself, but the key thing is it should be possible to actually deploy this within an LTE carrier. And an airband IoT actually allows for even lower cost of devices, even longer battery life. As you can see, I mean, with an airband IoT, we actually go down to bandwidth, which is as small as 200 kilohertz. It's not really a kind of, it's not just a random number, it's actually the same thing as the GSM bandwidth. This really kind of comes from the fact that originally the narrowband IoT was seen as a, a kind of replacement for the GSM for, GSM for these applications. So uh, when it comes to massive MTC, I mean, it's not really a focus for NR there. On the other hand, when it comes to the critical MTC or the URLC, that's very much kind of, a line, uh, kind of in the focus of NR. That's really seen as a key area for NR all the way from the start and even so more as part of the NR evolution. And that's about kind of providing this kind of very high reliability, very high availability and also very low latency. And that can be for a lot of different services. It can be services kind of normal, in some still normal wide area covering cellular services. But it could also be completely different type of deployments. It could be a, a, a deployment just within a factory, which it sounds to be kind of, uh, kind of not really what we no normally think about when it comes to cellular communication. But we are looking into a lot of such applications for, uh, for NR as well. And as I said, very low latency has already been covered by already the first release. The very high reliability and availability, partly for the first release, but even more focus now uh, when we go into next release of, of NR. Okay, before I end, I will sneak in also a little bit about uh, 5G core network. This is not at all my, my area of expertise, but uh, as I'm a radio expert. But in parallel then to the development of NOR, this new 5G radio access technology, 3GPP is also has also been working on a new core network that is referred to as 5G CN. Uh, so then as a, in some as a replacement or as an alternative to the current core network, which is called EPC, which is for LTE. But the important thing here is that I mean, man can really envision different options or combinations when it comes to our interfaces and, and core networks. So if you look here, we have the option one is kind of the, the basic LTE operation. We have LTE connected to its core network. And option two is in some sense the basic NR deployment where we have NR operating with the 5G core network. But then there are different possibilities also kind of NR LTE joint operation where you have this dual connectivity device connected to both NR and LTE and then 
with different combinations of, of the core networks. We can have option three here, which is like LTE and NR in dual connectivity, where all the control planes go via LTE and using only EPC as the as the core network. And we can have other combinations where we have N or NLT in dual connectivity, but uh, using the 5G core network. And you can see we can even have uh, LT in itself connected to the 5G core network. In that case, I mean, the especially I talked mentioned non standalone operation. That's really this uh, LTE, NR, dual connectivity with all control plane going via LT and having the EPC as, as the, as the um, core network. And this is the, actually the first, this is actually the first uh, way of deploying L NR. And actually, in practice, this is today the only way of deploying NR, as the 5G core, core network is not yet fully available. And that actually means that the original, the first deployment of NR will be this kind of non-standalone operation, where the device is in dual connectivity with LTE and NR, so it's communicating with both LTE and NR at the same time, and actually all the control plane functionality goes via LTE, and the NR carrier or the NR only provides a kind of complementary high-rate uh, data pipe, and the core network is then based on EPC, and this is this is the Today, the only way of actually operating NR, quite soon, of course, the 5G core network will be available. But I would still say that this dual connectivity between LTE and NR will, in many cases, re will remain as a very important way of deploying the system. And there are the funda one fundamental reason for this is, is kind of pure robustness. If, if we look at the a typical NR deployment, could be that an operator has an LTE macro network operating on lower frequencies and wants to deploy N or higher frequencies with an inherently much smaller cell. So it can be like a small cell deploying operate high frequencies such as kind of 28 gigahertz. And such a high frequency small cell deployment, it's of course it provides extremely high capacity, extremely high data rates, but it is also inherently less robust in the sense that I mean devices can very easily just go around the corner and complete and directly lose uh, connectivity to the network. But by then having this dual connectivity with LTE, uh, one is not losing the full connectivity, one is losing just the NR leg, one is using this high speed data pi pipe, but you still have all the control playing up and running and you still have data can go via LTE until you restore the connectivity to the NR network. So this kind of dual connectivity provides High, higher robustness, especially in these heterogeneous deployments, they have like a macro layer and a small cell layer at the same time. There are also cases when we run a dual connectivity even on, on the same site. We have LTE and NR on the same site and the same macro grid. Then it could simply be in this kind of migration scenario that you are taking half your spectrum that you use for LTE and put NR there. But by then providing able to be connectivity with both LTE and NR at the same time, at least the NR devices, they will still be able to utilize the full bandwidth uh, occupied by both LTE and NR. And there could also be cases when, I mean, even this co-sighted deployment, the NR carrier is still operating on much higher frequency bands. Then maybe the NR will not reach all the way out to the cell border. Once again, getting a little bit of a kind of problem with the robustness when you lose the connectivity out of the cell border. But when, if you are continuously then connected to both LT and NR, you get much higher robustness. So in general, this LTE NR dual connectivity uh, is something that will be a very way, common way of operating systems in the future, and it's actually key to some extent for having very high robustness for this high frequency operation. Okay, final slide about NR release 16. I mean, as I said, we have now finalized release 15, at least officially. There are, of course, still several minor issues left to be fixed, and that is still the highest priority in 3GPP. But the focus is more and more going into the next release of, of, um, of NR. And what are then covered there? I mean, I already mentioned even higher focus on this kind of enhanced reliability and availability for even better support for this URLLC type of services. <clears throat> there are discussions about looking, going into even higher frequencies. At the first step, 
I mean, as the practice now, we are at 40 gigahertz around maximum frequency, going up to 100, which would then also include, for example, the unlicensed spectrum at 60 gigahertz and the E band at 70 and 80 gigahertz. Um, and I've said 60 gigahertz unlicensed spectrum. One other thing we are going in, looking into is actually having NR also operating with unlicensed spectrum as a complement to the license spectrum. That is something that is already possible for LTE and it's very natural to do that also for NR. Finally, one more area which I think is um, actually in some sense very interesting. It's the, what we call integration of access and backlog IAB. This is essentially about using NR not only for the access link between a base station and a device, but actually also for communication via base stations, I mean, as a replacement for the back normal backhaul links. I mean, only today, of course, we are using a lot of wireless technology in our backhaul uh, to get data down to base stations, but that is today typically based on high, very high frequencies, line of sight conditions, and I mean, proprietary technology, the technology developed by different companies. But now with, with uh, NR, we are anyway going to higher frequencies also for the access link, and we are anyway have to have wireless backhaul for non-line of sight conditions, wireless backhaul down to small cells down on street level. So in some sense, the requirements and the characteristics of the access link and the backhaul link becomes more similar. And then it's very natural actually to consider why not use the same technology there? Why not use the same pool of spectrum for the wireless and the backhaul? So, so that is really part of this IB work. Essentially using NR not only for the access link, but also in the backhaul. And eventually, of course, this goes more and more to some kind of multi-hop communication where NR is used to communicate hopping between base stations and then eventually from, this, uh, from the kind of final base station down to the device. There are also other, uh, there are also other activities going on for release 16, but these are some of the most important. So that essentially uh, finalizes this presentation. I hope it was of some value for that, for, uh, for you. I just would like to make you... If you would like to learn more, you can uh, preferably have a look at our latest book about 5G NR, which tries to um, from summarize uh, in much more technical details all the aspects of the 5G NR radio interface based on our experience in the 3GPP standardization. So I hope this was valuable for you, for you, valuable for you and thank you very much for listening in.